my name is Ishmael Abdul Haq, and I am here today at the UC Davis uh, Access Media. And uh, what we're going to do this evening is have a discussion uh, pertaining to interfaith relations and the contributions that have been made by uh, Muslims. <laughs> So today here I have with me uh, Imam Abu uh, Qadir el -Amin, and then I have Imam Antar Jannah, and then I have Imam Omar Sharif. And just briefly, I would like for you gentlemen to uh, give us some little insight into uh, who you are, where you come from, and your association with this particular type of topic that we're discussing today. Imam Mabu Kadir Lamine, would you like to go first, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Uh, my name is Abu Kadir El Amin. I'm the Imam uh, at the San Francisco Muslim Community Center. Uh, I've been serving at that, at that community since 1984. Uh, I feel it's a privilege to be here representing that community. Uh, I've been a Muslim in this community uh, for a short period of time in, 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 in some context, a long period of time in other contexts. Uh, I feel like it was just yesterday, uh, the ideas about Islam and what it meant for uh, giving me a, a new lease on life and a different way that I could recreate myself and make a contribution to the society at large. Uh, so I've been serving in San Francisco, been involved in interfaith activities uh, prior to going to San Francisco, but uh, greatly encouraged by the leadership of Imam W.D. Muhammad, who encouraged us to get to know our neighbors, to get to get know our civic uh, uh, leaders, our police department, law enforcement officials, our neighbors, our, our Christians and Jews that lived in the community with us. So that's been a labor of love on my part. And our community, we're all connected with people like that because we're a minority community in terms of numbers. Many of us uh, have mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters that have different faith persuasions than us. Absolutely. So interfaith for us come natural. Every time it's Thanksgiving, that's <laughs> interfaith gathering for us. <laughs> and I'll just stop there. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, Imam um, Antar Jenner, would you like to give us a, a brief introduction to you? Yes, um, my name is Antar Jana, as he said. Uh, I'm the uh, executive director of an organization called Masjid. It's an acronym for Muslim Adhan School of Jana, Iksan, and Dawah. And uh, that's uh, based in Sacramento, California right now. Um, I've been a Muslim since 1975, uh, when Imam Murthy Muhammad took over the leadership of the Nation of Islam. Uh, I joined. And since that time, I've been involved in interfaith dialogue. I was the national director of the CREATE Committee, the Committee for the Removal of All Images that Attempt to Portray the Divine. And we, we, I think we made a big impact on interfaith dialogue all around the world mm -hmm. with that organization. And, uh, and after that, uh, I became the resident imam of East Palo Alto, like Imam Al-Qadir al is on the same day. In 1984, <laughs> right. and uh, yeah, neighbors, I, I served until 1994, and then I went into the California Department of Corrections and became a chaplain in 1994, and I retired in uh, 2014 after 20 years, and uh, now uh, I'm uh, directing Masjid, like I like I said, mm -hmm. Masjid Thank organization. You. Thank you so much. We appreciate that, uh, Imam Omar Sharif. Yes. Um, as uh, indicated, I'm uh, Omar Dawood Sharif, originally from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I came into uh, the religion of Islam oh, back in 1970 uh, under the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And uh, I was um, a, a minister under his leadership for several years until 1975 when Imam Warfdi Muhammad became uh, the leader. And uh, of course, we went through the transition at that time. And uh, I was an Imam for a brief moment until I moved to California and I moved to Sacramento, California, mm. where I eventually became the Imam for, uh, for Masjid As-Sabur, uh, which is a 
relatively uh, new, no, it's not a new community, but it's, we're, let's put it like this, we're in a new building. <laughs> we had, uh, we, we were blessed as a community to, um, to construct the building from ground up, um, uh, and it's about three years old now. And I was the imam there for about eight years prior and uh, until I took a back seat to our present imam, who is Imam Hazem Rashid, who I'm assistant to him. And, uh, and grateful to be able to serve in that capacity. Um, I'm pretty much, uh, that is my history in a nutshell. So we can move on from there, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that from all three of you distinguished gentlemen. What I would like to do uh, at this time is I'd like to get into the transition period mm. from 1975. And, and, and before you answer that, Give me a little bit of, of, of background prior to you coming into the fold of Islam. Mm. I would like to start with uh, Imam Abu Qadir al uh, Before becoming uh, uh, a Muslim where I ascribed, uh, declared my faith, I was heavily influenced by young people who were attracted to the message of Honorable Elijah Muhammad, as it was being publicly proclaimed by individuals like uh, Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. So that first got my attention while I was a teenager. And my older brother, uh, Eugene Robert Earl Jr., uh, began to attend the mosque and he began to bring literature home. Mm. And many of my peers uh, began to attend the mosque. I didn't attend the mosque at 13 or 14 years old when my older brother and some of my friends began to attend the mosque, but I began to read the literature. And I remember once I was uh, 14 years old, this is a little background, and you know, we're not angels, so I, I think I can talk about this. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe somebody will benefit. <laughs> and, and I took some pills. Uh, pills were popular in our neighborhood. You know, you probably heard of Red Devils, mm -hmm. Lily F40s, Bullet Heads, <laughs> Yellow Jackets, all the, <laughs> and I took uh, quite a few, and I thought I was gonna die. I was mm -hmm. 14 years old, mm -hmm. and uh, I said, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, if you just <laughs> let me come down, I won't mm -hmm. do this again. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, and that was really, I was sincere. But I didn't do it to that extent. <laughs> uh, so that was my first introduction to Islam, was seeing young people uh, that I grew up with change their life. Mm. Uh, the message had a, a transforming effect on them. And I knew them in one way. And then when they got involved with the teachings of Islam, as they understood it at that time, uh, they, they underwent a great uh, Metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. They went from being dishonest to being honest. Mm -hmm. They went from being uh, roughnecks to being courteous and mm -hmm. respectful and decent. So I saw a major change in them, and that made an impact on my life. Mm -hmm. And then at about 17 years old, uh, after uh, experiencing uh, some things, um, some traumas in my life, I began to declare myself as a Muslim, mm -hmm. though I wasn't uh, part of an organization. So uh, I started learning a little bit about some of the beliefs, and I ascribed to those beliefs. I didn't know how to pray or any of those things, but I was, in my heart, a Muslim. And I, I committed myself to Islam in 1967. I stopped drinking alcohol. I stopped mm. smoking weed. I stopped doing those things. And uh, I didn't have a support system, so that lasted for about 90 days. <laughs> <laughs> But I was sincere. And then later, uh, 1970, a life-changing event happened in my life. And uh, I, I, I decided that uh, from then on, I would be a dutiful Muslim. Mm. And I began to learn from Elijah Muhammad. I learned my prayers. I learned the beliefs of Islam. I learned to believe in the Allah and to believe in the Quran and believe in Muhammad the prophet. Mm. And I began to apply those things to my life and it helped me to become a better person. So that was my early beginnings. And then uh, when W.D. Muhammad became the leader, I'm trying to be brief mm -hmm. without, you know, not really telling the story. Uh, when W.D. Muhammad became the leader, I was serving a life sentence in prison. Mm -hmm. And the language that he brought was different than the language his father was bringing. Though his father brought a language that helped transform our lives and make us better people, with Imam W.D. Muhammad's language and his new 
direction, I saw opportunity for freedom. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can get out of this prison mm -hmm. under this new message. And I began to ap apply myself in that way. And I was able to come home. I came home December the 4th, 1978. And I immediately went to the mass jail and got involved with the community and been there ever since. Which mass did you go to? Uh, when I first came home, I went to a masjid, what was called Masjid Muhammad in Oakland, California. Imam John Fakir and Fahim Shuey pitch, picked me up from the jail and brought me to the masjid. My first day there, they put me on the roster. <laughs> and I said, it was so short, I can remember it verbatim. <laughs> I said, Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah for being here. I hope I can be an asset to the community. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, praise be to Allah. And, uh, uh, Imam W.D. Muhammad appointed me as Imam uh, in 1981, and I've been serving in that capacity ever since. Oh, oh, Akbar. Thank you so much for that introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, Imam um, Antar? Okay. Um, I, my, my story is similar. <laughs> I, um, uh, it was, it was, I think a lot of us came through the same door that Malcolm came through. Yeah. Um, before uh, I, I, I accepted Islam, I was from East Palo Alto, and it was involved in um, a lot of crime, uh, and ended up uh, in, in federal prison at 20 years old. And uh, that's when I came in contact with the Muslims on an academic level, because they were kind of trying to get me to come to the meetings, but but I wouldn't go. But I, but I would read the papers, and 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 I, I would try to get familiar with it, and I, and I didn't understand it, but uh, when I paroled, um, I had read a book in prison called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, and Napoleon Hill talked about Prophet Muhammad in his book, if you get an original copy. And um, so when I got out, uh, I, was, I was renting a room for my auntie, and it was a snack shop up on the corner on Randolph Street in San Francisco. So I'd go there and buy food, sandwiches, and they'd give me a paper, free papers. And so I started reading the papers. And these papers were different than the ones I was reading in the prison because Elijah Muhammad had passed and W.D. Muhammad was the leader now. Mm -hmm. And so um, I started reading and then eventually I was picked a book off my father's shelf and, and, uh, in, his, in, his, in his bookshelf. He got a, a copy of Best to a Black Man. Mm. And, uh, and, and uh, he must have went to a meeting or something. He's probably following mm -hmm. a, a nice looking sister there or something. <laughs> they gave him a book and a bean pie or something. So he brought the book on, put it on the shelf, and I read it. <laughs> and when I read that book, that, that really turned me around. Mm. And I decided I wanted to join. So I joined the Nation of Islam in 1975, and I moved right into the FOI house on Oakdale Street in San Francisco. That was where the, the, the men who, who were working for the Nation, selling fish and things like that, we stayed there. And so uh, I, I was on the fish crew, then I worked in the snack shops, I sold the papers, uh, you know, I did all of that, and finally ended up in Oakland uh, at, at Master's War theme. And um, then Imam Warthin Muhammad moved to town. He became the resident Imam of Oakland, California. And uh, that's when I was the director of the Cray Committee in Oakland. And Imam Melamine came and we were working together. And uh, Imam made me the national Cray chairman and then, uh, you know, the rest is history. That's, that starts our, our interfaith mm -hmm. dialogue. Yeah. And yes. so coming from the prison uh, all the way into, you know, Islam and actually, you know, becoming a leader, you know, that was all because of Imam Muhammad. I think we were 30 at that time. I was 30 years old. All of us were around 30. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started appointing people to positions. Mm -hmm. I think he was 48. And he started appointing people to positions. And uh, that, I think that was a really bold move. Because you know we got to do that today. You know, get young people involved uh, right. in the faith and following his example. But yeah. that's how I ended up becoming a leader. Wow, yeah. that's interesting. I appreciate that. Mm. It was so deep because what it tells me about both of you is that you came from good Christian backgrounds, <laughs> and you knew how to already operate within that circle. Mm. But the soul was calling you to something more, mm. something more, and for you to be kind of like a, a bridge between the two, already being. Uh, as you would say, uh, preempted or preconditioned for the interfaith movement. Mm -hmm. uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, Imam Sharif. Yes. Well, I think my path was a little different than my brothers here. <laughs> Thank Allah. Uh, 
<laughs> though, I do have, I, though I do appreciate and understand fully uh, your story and can identify with it. But uh, yeah, my path was a little different. I, um, I uh, went to, uh, I, of course, being a, I'm a tall person, I'm six foot nine, and I played uh, sports uh, basketball for a great, well, actually, since the sixth grade. Uh, I've been playing basketball, so I was fortunate enough to uh, win a scholarship to uh, school, uh, uh, a couple of schools. Well, one that I finally went to was uh, Midwestern University in Wichita Falls, Texas, and uh, there I spent uh, my three, uh, three years there. Uh, and uh, the path started for me there because I came home one summer, it was in the summer of 1967, and that's when a lot of things were happening in the African-American communities and in our society as a whole. There were a lot of things happening. Mm. And so I, um, you know, was fortunate enough to run into some people who were beginning to see things a little differently than we were raised as uh, the brothers already gave you some inkling of the kind of things that went on in our communities. But um, I started seeing things from another perspective. Uh, when I went back to school, I was wearing uh, booba suits, uh, which was a dashiki, I guess no. I could call it that. Okay. Uh, but the whole outfit, I had transformed <laughs> from a, uh, I would say, yeah. from a Negro <laughs> to an African. <laughs> but that's what we were doing in those days. Uh, yeah. That transition was happening. Uh, and that's a whole story in and of itself. But, I got back to campus and of course my coach was astounded at my transformation and didn't quite appreciate it as much as I did. Uh, and uh, toward the end of my last year there, which is 1968, um, on campus they had what they call Old South Week. And this is when they would dress up in Confederate uniforms and march all through the campus. It was their celebration of the Confederacy. So at that time, my awareness had raised. And I said, well, this is not going to do. So I organized the African Americans on the campus at that time. And we all wore, we, we stenciled black fist on a white t-shirt with black power on the back. Mm. And we started from the opposite end of the campus and met the mid-campus. And it, you can imagine it was kind of disrupted their, their party. Uh, and from there, I, uh, my eligibility was up that year. So if you, anybody knows anything about, anything about the black athlete, when your eligibility is up, you have, they have no more use for you. Mm, right. So uh, all of the, the, the perks and things that I was used to, that I would maybe get in a little difficulty and the coach would come to my rescue, was no rescue. To make a long story short, I came home in this awareness uh, and uh, fortunately got drafted by the Baltimore Bullets. So I had a letter of intention to go do that. But meanwhile, you know, um, I got involved with the revolution, as we used to call it. And I went from the Panthers to the uh, black nationalists to uh, the Pan-Africanists to everything you can imagine. I went through all the isms uh, and um, wound up at, in 1969 at a conference. I was with an organization called the BCD. And this was a, at the Pan-African Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. And at that time is when I realized something was wrong. Because the leadership um, had gotten to the point at that time had become somewhat co-opted. And we were now fighting amongst ourselves, mm. if you can imagine that. So at this time, uh, they had a speaker. And his name was Minister Louis Farrakhan. And I knew nothing about him. Now, man, I grew, I said, as I said before, I grew up in Chicago. Chicago was the headquarters for the Nation of Islam. Right. I grew up not knowing not one thing about the Nation of Islam. I grew up as a Catholic in the Catholic Church. I went to public school, so I knew nothing about them. I lived not more than less than two miles away from the main temple. I still knew nothing about them growing up to show you how God works. Mm -hmm. So... All of a sudden, I'm, I'm on security mm. at the conference. And I'm, on, I'm sitting in front of the stage. My, I'm on one side, another gentleman's on the other side. And we're sitting here stern, you know, on security. All of a sudden, Minister Louis Farrakhan works, walks on the stage. And I had no knowledge of him or nothing. He started talking. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. 
I said, I was listening to myself, who is this? You know, what is he talking about? <laughs> who is this guy, Elijah Muhammad? Who is this guy? You know, I'm like sitting here just going crazy trying. I want to turn around, but I'm not supposed to, you know? So I said, I can't take it. I turned around. <laughs> and uh, Minister Farrakhan was representing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew at that point that something had to change because the people I was following were going to eventually get me killed or make me crazy. So when I got home from that conference back to New Jersey, I told my wife, I said, we're moving. And we moved to Philadelphia, where I then joined the Nation of Islam. Um, from there, the story uh, is old. I became a, uh, I was a soldier, of course, selling papers, doing all that we do. I became a lieutenant, then I became the first officer, then I became a minister. I was a minister in Chester, Pennsylvania for about a year. I was pulled from there, brought back to Philadelphia. I was the minister at 12D for Oh, I guess for the remaining five years until 1975 when Imam Warfati Muhammad, uh, Wallace Muhammad as he was known at that time, came to be the, in the leadership of the nation of, it, uh, of, the, of our, the world community. And, and when he came in, and I'm just going to say this, we were at a point in time in our history as far as the nation of Islam was concerned, if, if the Imam had not come in, <laughs> I dread to think what our community would eventually would have looked like because things were beginning to go amiss. He came in, it was like a breath of fresh air. Yeah. His language was completely different. Yeah. I, I, and let me, if, you, if you don't mind, I'd like to digress for one minute. Mm -hmm. I can remember before that time when he came back to the community, two years prior to Elijah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's passing, his father let him go and told him, go teach anywhere you want. You teach, you go. And I remember going home one day to Chicago and uh, I went to the temple just because that's what we did. So I went to the temple one Wednesday night, and I knew I never had met him, never d didn't even know anything about him, other than some of the stories they told. So I'm sitting in the in there. I'm just a guest at this time. I'm not official in anything. I'm just a guest, and I'm all of a sudden this brother comes on. And he starts talking, and I'm listening to him. Now you know our language was. Yeah. was kind of raw yes. back during the Nation of Islam time. Right. So I'm listening to him, and I'm saying, well, what is he talking about? Who is this? And what's he talking about? He's talking about submarines and birds and things like this, nature. He's, he's talking about nature, and he's relating it to Islam, something we just had. It was Like I said, it was a breath of fresh air. So I'm listening. I said, oh, my goodness. So eventually when I left, I found out who he was. Two years later, he's the leader. Like I said, it was a breath of fresh air. Um, I, I was delighted when he came in. So I was a minister at the time. We were called imams. We weren't really imams. We didn't know nothing about what an imam was or what it, to be, what it was really like to be an imam. But we transitioned from ministers to imams. So I was that. And I was that until I left uh, 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 Philadelphia and moved to California. So basically, as I already stated, I became a minister, uh, imam at, uh, in in um, Sacramento, so I'm skipping a whole lot, but that's pretty much my history in terms of how I got to where I am oh. today. So forgive me for no, no, for no. Going to yeah, no. yeah, no. It, was, it was very much appreciated. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. brought back so many other different points of reference yeah. in history during the '60s in that turbulent yeah. time. Oh yeah, and and especially in in the uh, in, in in the um, inner cities. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. in the top of a uh, 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 systematic yeah. oppression that was going on, and so I I, I see it was necessary, mm -hmm. you know, for uh, listen to each one of the um, uh, 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 growths that have taken place in you gentlemen. Yeah. You know, believe me, you could have a program on that alone. That's that right. would be so eye-opening to people who don't really know how the, the things that we went through, why we went through them, the transition. Uh, that's a very interesting history that people know nothing about. Mm. Yeah. Sounds like a purifying fire. Yes. <laughs> mm. But um, I wanted to touch basis also on um, uh, on your relationship, uh, Imam um, Abu Qadir Lamin, about uh, uh, with Imam um, W. D. Muhammad. C could you a, a little bit elaborate on the relationship that you, the personal relationship that you had with the Imam? Mm. Right. Uh, I think my personal relationship with Imam W. D. Muhammad uh, began way before I met him, mm. because I met his mind. Mm. I met his ideas. Yes. I met his spirit. Yes. I met his devotion in the things that I read about him and the things that he shared with us 
and the kind of encouragement that he gave us to have uh, trust and faith in God mm -hmm. and to take responsibility for ourselves, for our family, for our neighborhoods, for our communities. So long before I met him, I'd already met him. Mm -hmm. I met him before he became the leader. Mm -hmm. uh, reading about him in the, in the newspaper. Speaks. And uh, he had came back, like he, uh, Imam Omar mentioned, he had came back, he had been excommunicated from the community, and he came back and they, uh, he was talking, this was 1972 when he came back, and he was talking about one day in America, you would hear the Adhan called in neighborhoods, you would see mm -hmm. minarets going up, mm -hmm. you would see Muslim women and children and families and neighborhoods, and we were going to make our contribution to beautifying the, 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 the fabric of America. Mm -hmm. So long before I met him personally, I had met all of those things that I wholeheartedly embraced and incorporated into my desire mm. for the kind of life that I wanted to have. <clears throat> so uh, then when I first got a chance to meet him, it was in 1976. He came to San Quentin Prison and he taught a lecture called uh, the natural elements testify to the truth of the Quran and Muhammad. Mm. And he tied that to nature and to history, mm. and it was such a beautiful lecture. And at that time, I was the secretary for the Nation of Islam. Uh, we, we were calling ourselves, we had just started calling ourselves World Community of Islam in the West. Mm. San Quentin. At San Quentin State. With George Prison. Jackson, the same place where he was? Same place where he was. I was there when he got assassinated. That's another story. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, I was holding a clock and a pair of shoes, tailor-made shoes, and a $300 check for the imam. And a brother from Sacramento had introduced Imam W.D. Muhammad. And uh, afterwards, we were giving him some gifts. And uh, one of the things that the imam said, his name is uh, Emery Bilal Hansen, mm -hmm. he said, uh, when we heard that you had accepted our invitation to come here, we wanted to lay down palm leaves for you. <laughs> you came into the city. He said, so we, but we couldn't get the palm leaves, so we had a pair of shoes made for you. Uh -huh. A brother named uh, James uh, Abdul Musawir made a pair of shoes for the imam, handmade shoes, and he put his initials in them in gold, WDM. And uh, imam, so that was the first time I actually got to meet the imam. I gave him the clock, I gave him the check, Bilal gave him the shoes, and I got to shake his hand. Mm. Uh, but I had met him before that. And then uh, once he moved to Oakland uh, to become our resident imam, I was actually there the day he accepted to become our resident imam. And I was just so happy. I normally was going to the mosque in San Francisco, but also had a little part-time business. So I would supply my customers with products twice a month. So I was in Oakland to pick up some of my products. And when I would always drive by the masjid if I was in Oakland. And when I drove by the masjid, I saw the security brothers on the back door. I said, oh, security on the back door? Must be somebody important here today, so <laughs> I'm staying. So instead of going back to San Francisco, where uh, Imam Talib Dean Ansari was our imam at that time, I went, and Imam Muhammad was there. <laughs> and uh, after he threw his, he said he wanted to throw his hat in to be the resident imam. We accepted him as our imam. <laughs> I was the first person to greet him after he said he was our imam. Mm -hmm. I, I greeted him. I said, Brother Imam, I'm here. Anything you need me to do, I'm here. And uh, I'm waiting for instructions. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Well, just disperse. <laughs> 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 so uh, we developed a closeness. And then, uh, to be real brief, uh, I moved to Oakland. Mm -hmm. I was living in San Rafael at that time. And uh, in my zeal and in my fervor, I said, Imam Muhammad is in Oakland. I'm moving my family to Oakland. I want my children to go to the Muslim school. And uh, against my wife's better judgment, I moved to Oakland. Mm -hmm. You know, my wife said, we can stay here and keep doing like we've been doing. Ain't drive to Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you know how I think. Oh, yes. Oh, and I yeah. moved so close to the masjid, I could hear there there mm. from my house. And uh, whenever the man would go out of town, Imam Antar would bring his car to my house and park it in the back. <laughs> it was secure. <laughs> so, you know, we became close. Not as uh, friends, as much as a, a follower, a supporter, uh, supporting a great leader. Mm -hmm. yes. And we wanted to do everything that we could to make sure that 
Uh, his stay in Oakland was a benefit, and we wanted to do the things that he was encouraging us to do, to go out in the community, build, build friends and relationships, mm -hmm. and to be involved in what was going on in our neighborhoods and make our contribution to beautifying the society. Mm -hmm. So that's what he encouraged us to do. So it was, it was fun. And then he didn't micromanage us. He would tell us to go out and, you know, and if we made a little mistake, <laughs> he would sometimes, you know, pull you to the side. And if you made a big mistake and a lot of people knew about it, he'd correct you in the public. <laughs> but he did it with such love that we just, it just brought us closer to him. Mm -hmm. And we appreciated having that opportunity. Uh, he would send us into the churches and he would tell us what to say and then we would uh, go and represent his message to the people in the churches. And we got a great response. Mm -hmm. And the people loved him and the people loved us and they said, well, you know, give us some time to work with our people because we were dealing with racial images in religion at that time. Mm -hmm. And the racial images in, in religion, we thought, was uh, doing damage to our community because we don't believe that human beings are fit to be uh, worshipped as an as a object of worship. We believe that only the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one that's unseen, is deserving of our worship. No human being, another human being, shouldn't bow to another human being. Mm. So that was the gist of it. Right. But at the same time, he was trying to help us to correct a defective spirit mm. that had imp impacted mm. our whole community. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Imam Antar. Mm. Yeah, can you uh, elaborate on your relationship with the, with the Imam, your personal okay. relationship? Well, when... Um, when uh, I joined uh, the Masjid in Oakland. Uh, I was the local Cray Committee chairman. For the imaging. And, 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 yeah, remove okay. all images Churches. from worship. And, and we would go to talk to the pastors like Ibn Malamin said, and, and kind of, we'd give them 90 days after we talked to them to, to remove the statues. Because we were going by the Bible, Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5 said, you will have no graven images of anything mm. in the air, on land, or below the sea. Absolutely. You don't bow down to no image. So we, we weren't taking the Quran. We were taking the Bible. Right. And so if they, and everybody had statues and pictures. So if they didn't take them down, we picketed the churches nonviolently, didn't disrupt the meeting or, mm. or block them from coming in and out of the church. And uh, but we were just trying to protest. And so Imam Muhammad moved to Oakland. When he moved to Oakland, he witnessed what we were doing and uh, now we were a very active community around the Bay Area. And uh, then he appointed me to be the national Cray chairman. Wow. And, uh, and you know, it just blew my mind. Like, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so I got an opportunity to travel around the country, you know, under his leadership. But, but, but right after that, he, um, I was making dur, a noon prayer, in the masjid one day. And I looked over to, out of the corner of my eye, and he was making dur too. And he came over to me after prayer and asked me, did I have a driver's license? And I said, yeah, I got a driver's license. He said, let me see it. <laughs> <laughs> so I showed him my driver's license. He said, you know, I'm here now in Oakland. I want you to ride with, uh, if you would like, I, you ride with me and the former imam. And my car is coming from Chicago, and then I need somebody to be with me. Not to drive, because I can drive, but just to be with me uh, while I'm in Oakland. And he offered me a job to be his assistant. At that time, I was getting ready to be a professional boxer manager, promoter, I had everything. And I had to go back to all those people and tell them, quit. <laughs> I quit. And I went to work for Imam Muhammad for about $800 a month, a, a meal or less. Yeah. And uh, so I, for the nine months that he was in Oakland, I was with him like every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, traveled with him out of town and, you know, and then, and I was also traveling with Craig. So I got an opportunity uh, you know, I'm gonna write a book about it one day, <laughs> or, do, or, or, do, or do something, a video or something, because for that nine months, that was a very interesting time for me. Absolutely. As a young man, to be um, with him, the leader of the community, of the mm -hmm. national community, uh, every day. And I got one thing that was beautiful is I got to see him as a human being. Mm -hmm. Yes. All the personality worship and all that mm -hmm. stuff was out the window. Mm -hmm. I got to see him as a man, mm -hmm. as a father, as a husband, as a human being. Right. and the leader of our community, and that was a blessing for me. And that was my kind of orientation to leadership. Mm. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. Imam Sharif. Yes. 
Um, I, I wasn't quite as fortunate as my brothers here to have been in that close proximity to uh, Imam Al Fadi Muhammad as far as physically is concerned. But I relate very closely to what Imam Kadiala means that in terms of I met him long before I, I actually met him. Met him through the mind and the, the expression of his, uh, his vision and leadership that he was giving us, and, and that made me very close to him. And I want to say this about Imam uh, Al Fadi Muhammad. Um, you know, we, we talk about him in all these glorious terms, which we feel that way. But I want you to know he never solicited that kind of thing from anyone. Right. He was a very humble, down-to-earth person. And he, if you tried to heap those kind of praises on him, you would be in his disfavor because he didn't want that. And because right. his objective was to deliver the message that he understood from the Quran. And that was his... That was his whole purpose in life. And everything he did reflected that. Now, I had the occasion to meet the imam on several occasions, but uh, only in uh, where someone, I was with someone. Public gathering. Uh, public gatherings. Well, no, actually, and in private too, but I was with someone who allowed me to be with them while to go, <laughs> and then I would be able to meet him, shake his hand, give him the greetings, and so forth. On one occasion, I had the opportunity um, at, one, in fact, it was in San Francisco at the uh, one of the uh, 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 meetings that you brought him to. Right. And after that, we would go have lunch. Have lunch. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we were in the, in the restaurant, and somehow or other, I wound up directly across from him. And so I was a little nervous, because I what I'm going to say to you, ma'am, you know, because that's the kind of feeling we had to respect. But I want, as I said, it's not something he elicited. It's just something we had in us. Um, but I said, okay, he's just a brother. He's a brother, you know. So we got to, I said, we got to talk. And next thing you know, we were talking about movies. <laughs> he liked movies as much as I did. Yeah, I'm a movie right. person. Right. He really yeah, liked right. movies. So we got to talking about different movies that we've seen. And it was just a, it was just a pleasant thing to have experienced with a man who I so greatly admired uh, as much as I admired his father. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Absolutely. Uh, there's a history there that, uh, you know, it has to be told in full one day yes. so people can understand this trilogy of how this, this community came to be, how we, the, this community of, of uh, African Americans came to, 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 uh, came to El Islam. Yes. And it started with this gentleman called Farad Muhammad, who gave it to Elijah Muhammad, who raised a son, Imam Warfdi Muhammad. That's a significant history that people should understand because yes. it is so significant, not just to African Americans, it is significant to America to understand what happened. Right. And the effect that it had, not just on our community, but the community at large and the world. I know it sounds fantastic, but it is true. And if you understand it, then you'll understand what we're talking about, especially in light of today, when we see the kind of leadership that we have today. Right. That, that juxtaposed to that leadership that we're talking about is significant, and it needs to be told. Mm -hmm. So that was my experience with the imam. I, I, I appreciate that so much, and I'd just like to... Uh, for one moment, uh, you know, after listening to you, you gentlemen, and, and, and my personal self reflecting, uh, 96, mm. Seattle, Seattle Tacoma mm. International Airport, mm. uh, uh, Imam Pleman El Amin, mm. Imam Clyde Rahman, uh, and there was a couple uh, others Abdul there. Kareem Hassan. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, AK Hassan, AK yes. Hassan. And uh, I'm on crutches leg mangled up and uh, I'm sitting there and here comes the email mm -hmm. and then he calls me out by name. Mm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Assalamu alaikum. How you doing my good brother? Fine. <laughs> Ishmael, where are you on your way to? <laughs> Clyde comes in. Email Clyde comes in and says, uh, email, we got to get priority suit, priority seating for the for the elderly. And we, hey, hold up, I'm not elderly. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you see, I'm talking to the brother right here. <laughs> now back up. <laughs> <laughs> they they went on and scurried out the way. So I I, I understand the humanism and the down to earth and this yeah. of him and didn't want to be seen in that particular type right. of life. Sure. And, um, 
you know, I'm just, I, you know, I'm grateful, uh, you know, for that experience and, um, you know, for the opportunity to sit and talk with him and to him to enlighten me so much with a lot of information. Um, it, it was a pleasure of having you, you know, you gentlemen on the show today. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, inshallah, God willing, we'll have another opportunity to discuss and talk about, uh, you know, some other in-depth topics, but mostly back onto this interfaith aspect, sure. because right now it was just a little bit of lead in history into you guys, mm -hmm. into where you come from, into your points of reference and means of dealing with that. Yeah. Um, again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming here no, to uh, Davis, honor, California. Thank you. I you know, and coming thank to you. the uh, uh, Davis Media Access. And uh, with, that, with that, I'll say good night to our guest and, and, and to the uh, television land audience. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. God's peace be with you.